It's time to present Scott DuPont to bring you another episode of Finance Your Movie with tips and strategies to help you get your money to tell your story. It's time! Okay, we have another jam-packed show today. We're very, very happy and thrilled to welcome Stephen Shea, award-winning writer, director, producer. Uh, very, very busy, busy man. When I think of Stephen, just one word comes to mind, and that is abysmal, meaning yes. <laughs> abysmal entertainment. How are you, Stephen? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Oh, pleasure to be here. So um, just to clarify, we're, we're going to get in some stuff for audience, but just to kind of refresh my memory, did you go to University of Central Florida and Valencia film schools? I went to University of Central Florida, but could not get into the film school. So uh, to Valencia and finished out there. <laughs> oh, okay. In, into its film program. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, UCF, uh, I, was, I was kind of the weird genre kid in my group. And, um, you know, so I didn't fit in as well, I guess, UCF, but uh, but. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic program. Um, and that was about the time. That was a few years after uh, the Blair Witch Project blew up out of uh, UCF. Yeah. Yep. And they went to both also. They went to Valencia too. That's right. A few of the guys did as well. Mm -hmm. So for our, uh, for our audience, uh, I'm sure 99% of you know that was the most profitable independent film of all time. Uh, right in our backyards of Orlando, Florida, I think in 1998 or, or 99, yeah, somewhere About around 99. there. That's why you know, I went to UCF in the first place. Yeah, no, it was a huge, that. huge draw. I mean, people were flying in from all over the country after oh, yeah. that uh, explosion. It really excited um, a lot of micro-budget, low-budget film producers such as yourself. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So when you say you were kind of like the... Uh, I forget your exact words, but you were saying like the odd genre or whatever. I was the, like, I was the horror kid. Like I wanted to make horror movies and I think more for art house style filmmakers as opposed to commercial style filmmakers. So I didn't, I don't think I fit the, the mold they were looking for there at the time. Although, although in retrospect, you might've been a little bit ahead of your time because it's certainly evolved the last 20, 20 years or so. Oh, yeah. I mean, what, what I ended up doing was I ended up spending the rest of my college fund on my first feature. So then by the time I, my friends had graduated film school, I already had a movie on the shelves. So that helped out a lot. Wow. Would, now, was that The Night Owl? Yes. Okay. We're, we're going to get into that in just a minute. I, I want, I'm just curious, because I've always known you as a, a camera operator. Like, I remember that... Uh, Canon XL1 you had, mm -hmm. you had some kind of DSLR you were always walking around with, over yeah. 70 camera department credits. Um, mm -hmm. Did you start out this crazy journey uh, as a stills photographer or were you just shooting video or, or how, how did you get into this business before actually, you went to film school? Sure. I grew up in the Florida Keys on an island, so it was a little hard to get access to certain things, but at 16, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. I, I fell in love with movies and I worked at a local TV station there in Key West running camera, running camera on live television and commercial switching and editing deck to deck back then, uh, 798. And, um, and then by, and then also worked for the Florida film commission there in the key is putting together location portfolios and helping market to bring bigger productions down there. Um, which actually the first set I was ever on was true lies. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, I was there when they landed the Harrier jets on the seven mile bridge. And I got to watch all that in real time. And I was like, oh man, every movie is going to be like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is not the case. But to a 16 year old, I was super excited. And so, um, so I'd already- You were covering that for the TV station? I was working for the film commission. Oh, so wow. So kind of like a, wow. a, a local liaison when they were shooting there. Um, Cause I was interning with them at the time. Cause I was, I was like 16, 17. Very cool. Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's a big yeah. film. Yeah, that was that was pretty exciting. Um, and then 
to college, I had already had a couple years television experience with camera. And then after I graduated, my first gig was camera assisting at Nickelodeon Studios when they still shot in Orlando. Oh, wow. Um, and Valencia helped me get that job. And so I had always done video. I started photography later when I realized how much cheaper and easier it was, <laughs> but yet it was still a great creative outlet. Um, it's, I mean, it's the same as filmmaking, only it's one frame instead of 24 a second. So I started doing that as well. I, I started Abysmal Energy, which is my multi, multimedia company in 2002, which next year will be our 20th anniversary, which is pretty cool. And kind of figured out pretty quickly that you need to kind of do a little bit of everything to, to get more and more work. So started doing video production, editing, editing, and opening up to a lot of different kind of avenues. And, and now we've expanded during the pandemic into animation and comic books, like trying to figure out ways to produce from home without having to leave your house. Yeah, no, I've noticed that. You've always been very uh, adaptable. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of successful filmmakers, you, um, you started out doing a few shorts, but um, I want to pick up, well, let's talk about Andre the Butcher real quick. You were a co-producer on that. That was with Ron mm -hmm. Jeremy. Yep. Um, did they just pull you in or did you have anything to do with helping to raise any of the production funds? On that one, uh, we had finished The Night Owl and I had gotten kind of a reputation at the time for being like a good, like a local independent filmmaker that had gotten a movie made and sold. And so I got those two producers, Phil and James, and they were making that low budget horror movie and knew that I had kind of access to local talent and crew and equipment and stuff and so i kind of got brought into that they had already raised the money um, oh, okay and they had gotten investors that had been in the 70s that were kind of had taken a break for a few decades and then wanted to kind of get back into it and so they had put together a, a very small low budget for that movie um but that one ended up getting a really good distribution deal but back then it was a whole lot easier to get movie i mean you could make a five thousand dollar no budget movie and still get it into Hollywood video and into the stores. Life. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas yeah. nowadays it's like even $10 million Hollywood movies don't always <laughs> come out on physical media anymore. Yeah. Um, so let's, um, I, I got, I got the, uh, the sequence out of order. Let, let's jump into the night owl. Then you said yeah. you actually put up uh, some of your school tuition to finance this first feature length uh, film. Yeah, I, I figured out pretty early on that features were where it was uh, and how you make money. And so I wasn't completely prepared to just dive into a feature. So my first year, I was like, I'm going to make six short films in a year to kind of help me build the experience to then do a feature, which is just really a big, long short film. <laughs> I kind of did that plan and then did The Night Owl, which was totally... Uh, a bare bones friends in the woods with a camera kind of movie um i remember that. that that got a little bit of buzz i think you played at the enzion in a few local theaters yeah yeah we had a through the whole dmac screening that's right dmac Orlando, yeah uh with the um with the florida film group and stuff and so that was uh that was cool and that kind of got my name a little bit more locally that you know people could make independent movies so back then it was kind of this is around 2003 2002 2003 like independent cinema was sort of just starting this digital revolution was kind of happening and it was getting yeah. easier and cheaper for people with, with all movies. the 24p uh digital cameras yep so, so um what was the uh, what was the budget on the night owl do you remember or how much you put in i mean realistically we spent under 5,000 on it. Okay, um, so micro. Total micro. But then I did sign to an independent distributor that gave us all that back. Wow. Know, just G at the time. And uh, it got a DVD release. It was in Best Buy. and Wow. Uh, then it came out in a four pack with three other movies. Then it came out in like a 50 pack with 49 other movies. And so I, we learned pretty quickly. It's like the lower you easier it is to make back so you you broke you broke you broke even right out of the gate oh yeah yeah wow Con on your first feature congratulations thanks and it was i mean it's, it's very low budget I, I wouldn't recommend watching it now but 
since we've gotten. Yeah, a but bit there, better. you know, <laughs> there, there's a lot of films back in the day that were done five, ten thousand. That yeah. was kind of like the Wild West. And then um, jumping forward a few years, I remember there's tons and tons of buzz on Hoodoo for Voodoo. Yeah, we a did. A couple years later, we helped out with Andre the Butcher, and that got a really solid distribution and a really good dvd release and so based on that we started doing hoodoo for voodoo which is a horror comedy that we made ridiculously large for extremely low budget i mean there were 300 actors 26 locations we shot in two different states in new um, orleans too right louisiana shot half in louisiana and half in florida and i mean i think the final budget on that was still under twenty five thousand. wow um, wow with but, travel uh, and everything yeah, I mean, a lot of friends, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of favors, uh, which you do a lot with indie stuff. And yeah, and then um, we ended up getting a, a very small, we didn't get a great distribution deal at the time, because that was the time when things were starting to transition, <laughs> like let, out let, of. Let, let's back up just a, just a quick second for our audience, because mm -hmm. that that's a pretty, I mean, in today's dollars, that's a lot more money. But ba back in the day, you went from 5K to about 25,000. Where, mm -hmm. where did those investors come from? That was all self-funded. Um, credit cards. and Oh, so you, you did that yourself? I did it myself, yeah. Wow. Um, we took out kudos, a loan. Kudos to you. And we had built it kind of on the success of Andre the Butcher, seeing like, okay, Andre was a low budget, but then brought in, you know, a good chunk of money, thinking that we could replicate that, uh, which didn't end up happening, unfortunately. But it's because the times were changing so um, but at the time, I mean, we still had a DVD release, still did conventions and promoted. We had a bunch of uh, cameos in it with different scream queens and horror celebrities. So that you got some sort of distribution, made a little bit of money back. Yep. Yep. Made a little bit, not as, as much as we would have liked or thought we would have. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's, that's indie film. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Yeah. So, so moving fast forwarding, what, what are one of the other feature length movies that you were involved in putting together some of the funding, like Doomsday County, Two Days, Rockability? On all of those, Doomsday County was a partnership film with Full Sail that um, they had a group of students that had raised their own money and had, it was an anthology film. So each, each director had their own chunk to pay for their chunk of the movie. And they really needed a producer to kind of come on and help guide, uh, help guide that. And so I came on board that and helped kind of facilitate that movie, which we signed with Troma, which is the biggest. Oh yeah, Troma Entertainment. Which is the biggest like indie label, pretty much, uh, in 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 low budget indie stuff. But so 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 back up just a quick second. This is yep. really really fascinating, and I never knew this. Um, are we talking about Doomsday County now? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So what you're telling me is that you went over to this very large film school, for those of you who might not know, Full Sail Real World Education, which is the sister school of LA Film School, but in mm -hmm. Winter Park, Florida. And you found a bunch of students who were going to the school and they put up the money and brought you in as a producer. Because mm -hmm. I knew I'd worked with a lot of the professors there and they were like, oh, Steven's the horror guy. Like, you want to talk to him because he likes to do the horror stuff, which is true. And so I went and met with the, they had their plans laid out. They had already figured out how to shoot everything. They had their casts figured out. And it was like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And um, I had a previous relationship with Troma already. So wow. It was just from the festival or uh, the comic convention circuit, you know, meeting Lloyd Kaufman at different, and he was in Hoodoo for Voodoo as well. He cameoed in Hoodoo for Voodoo. So, so how many students uh, total were there? Four. There was four, four and, and, then, and then you and then you partnered. Yep. And, and they, uh, each, each, each of you got a little percentage of the film or shared in their profits or whatever. I mean, it also knowing trauma, there is not <laughs> there is probably not any profit to speak of at all, which we kind of knew going into it. And the directors knew that, too. So the movie came out, was released uh, to their audience, but I don't think. I mean, so the so the main thing is they were just trying to get a kind of a uh, uh, an awareness, a brand, right. like get get the film out. Right. So it was a it was a very low budget, a very very low, and so it wasn't 
No one because you you used anything. full sale facilities, right? Their sound right. stages, their back and lot. student crew and equipment and everything. So yeah, um, which was great because those those students all graduated having directed part of a feature film, which is cool. So I, I don't like to talk about this very much, but for any first time filmmakers who are out there looking for a distribution deal, I, I don't like to talk about the dark side, although there is one for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did that distributor at the time, or what, what do some distributors do? They, they, did they just kind of pick up the film and add on a bunch of advance costs that they never actually get any money back to you? Or do they promise you money and not deliver? They just not make right. any money? I feel like usually it's, it's like the added on costs. Um, and we'll talk about it later, but we just finished a movie that's coming out next week or this week that uh, we just did a whole distribution deal with too, which was, you know, even today, like still an interesting process. But most of the time, I feel like you kind of know when you're dealing with a distributor, you, you do a lot of research. And so you kind of see, okay, we'll go reach out to five or 10 other filmmakers who have released a movie with that distributor and ask, hey, did you get any return? Like, how was your relationship? How did it go? And I would say most of the time, you kind of know what distributors are going to make you money and you kind of know which ones are. Um, but then sometimes people don't have a choice. You might send your movie out to 50 different distributors and one says yes or two say yes. And they're two of the ones that aren't you know, doing as well. And so you have to make that decision then. And of course, nowadays, there's a lot more resources to sell than there was back then. Yeah, that was back in 2009, I think. Around yeah. 2009. Great, great advice, though, just to basically look on IMDb mm -hmm. and talk to a few of the filmmakers that had recent films released. And there's some cool, like even some YouTube uh, Facebook groups, you know, that have distributor Facebook groups where people will discuss their relationships and how things have gone. And I mean, you got to do the research. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, after that, I got hired on a movie, Rockabilly Zombie Weekend, and they already had their financing. They just some more producers on board and it was another horror film and so for that one that was a much larger budget um and they during the distribution process signed with an initial distributor that was interested promised the world we had never them you know tried to vet them and they the the main executive producer ended up going with them and they ended up getting the movie on television and in some cool spots, but didn't return anything. I think it was just, it's the similar process where it's like, well, you know, we have $25,000 of fees on this and we have $10,000 of fees on this. And I remember at one point, I forget which movie it was on. One of the distributors charged 25,000 for a poster. Wow. And I remember being like, job, like <laughs> I'll make a poster for 25. Now, now was that like, a line item it was a line item. report yeah did someone call about the twenty five thousand dollar poster it's i feel like it was still within what was negotiated as far as their initial expenses and so it was just kind of like mind-boggling to be like well i mean obviously you didn't spend twenty five thousand dollars on a poster but wow. you're saying you spent that uh so and that's that's i'm sure another distributor that was not i mean Getting a good distributor is very challenging, especially today. Um, and the, se the second big advice after your, your great advice, which is to uh, reach out to other filmmakers that have worked with the distributors, number two, make sure, no matter how comfortable you are reading uh, legal language, make sure you get a good entertainment attorney with yes. experience of reviewing distribution agreements because they'll they'll know to look out for a cap on how much a movie poster costs, especially when they're hiring some guy on Fiverr to do a little Photoshop for you know five yep. or ten hours. And even like with that, some people get scared with entertainment lawyers because it'll be like, oh, getting them to go over this contract might cost a couple thousand dollars or like even up to five thousand dollars, depending on the scope of work. But even for that we recently had with the distributor, our entertainment lawyer got their expenditures down by $15,000. So I'm like, well, that was money well spent because I just saved $15,000.
you know, on a, on a few thousand dollar expenditure. Yeah, and that, so that's those, right out of the gate. You know I mean, they, they might have caught you something down the road where you have oh, revenues yeah. coming in. Um, so if, if you can uh, hold over the break, I want to come back and talk about surviving Supercon. Yes.